we go along for those who are asking um, as we go forward. All right, so for further use. So now we're gonna hand over to engineer Kemp, who is coming to us from all the way in Chile. I believe he is at present. And he's a man that has over 30 years experience in engineering. And he's gonna bring that wealth of knowledge to us in a nice summarized version of it. Um, and like I said, time will be allotted for further questions to expand on that as he goes forward. So I wanna hand over to you now, engineer Kemp. Yes, uh, very warm, warm welcome from my side and uh, thanks to, to you, Dr. Ellis. But uh, I tried to share my screen, but I'm still blocked. So if you could... Uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, okay, I'll try it again. Share screen, there we are. So just, uh, can everybody see that? that? There you go, yeah, we can see you now. So we are in business, I think. So once again, yeah, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's still, it's still, it's still uh, uh, midday in, in Jamaica. And uh, warm uh, hello to uh, everybody. Yeah, my name is uh, Seth Joachim Kemp. And I'm the sales director for Latin America for, for Wittgen GmbH. And today I'm, a, I'm addressing you here from, from, from Chile, as already said. My thanks to the University of the West Indies and to the panel uh, for allowing me to contribute to this webinar initiative and to all of you for your participation. It's my privilege to give here the first presentation with the title Introduction to Materials BSM, Bitumen Stabilized Materials BSM. Uh, more than going into the detail of the technology, uh, which is maybe a little bit beyond the frame of uh, uh, time frame for a presentation like this one, I want to set this general stage uh, uh, for this type of of, of uh, technology. Um, and thus I will focus on issues and concepts which I think are fundamental uh, to understand the benefits this technology offers. So, what are we looking at? Um, and this is something that might be uh, familiar to everybody, worldwide roads and highways present uh, generalized and in many cases, premature damage. Uh, the world uh, and network uh, is uh, around, consists of 18 million kilometers, paved kilometers, and considering an effective service life of 18 to 27 years uh, for a hot mix asphalt, and maybe a little bit more, 25 to 37 years for a concrete pavement, the reconstruction of the complete road worldwide network uh, every 20 to 40 years or expressed differently the re or construction of uh, half a million to one million kilometers of paved road every year is required and this is hardly a sustainable situation The environmental impact, and this is, uh, you know, an issue that's been discussed widely in other ages. We just look at the United States with all these forest fires and uh, all other uh, more weather, uh, cyclones and, and hurricanes in, in, in the Caribbean. So, I mean, the environmental impact is another, another huge challenge for the worldwide road construction. Um, the worldwide demand for drastic re reductions of CO2 emissions inherent to many traditional road construction processes such as hot mix asphalt as we see here up in the uh, right, left corner, upper left corner, and concrete pavements uh, collides with the needs of uh, building hundreds of thousands of road kilometers each year as mentioned in the previous slide. The same applies to the provision of granular materials by traditional means, that is digging big holes and messing up our nature. 
this is becoming increasingly unpopular and expensive and in many cases uh, impossible. Yeah. There's many areas and most probably, especially in the Caribbean on the islands where there's just no, no way to, to, to poke more holes into nature to get granular materials. Also in road rehabilitation, materials in the existing pavements are still largely considered demolition waste deposited in non-environmentally friendly dumps. Now we are changing, we have a new crisis and this is basically where we are all in, on Zoom and I don't have the privilege to travel to, to, Trini, uh, to Trinidad or to Jamaica, which I would like and very, very much like to do and uh, experience the warm weather there. Uh, we're facing the coronavirus yeah? and uh, this is giving us a, a completely new challenge and completely new realities. In very few days, we changed from this on our roads to this and to this. And COVID-19 um, has also shown the need and importance of keeping up the supply chain. A functional, effective supply chain um, is um, important to maintain the health systems to fight the pandemic, supply and feed the population, guarantees the supply of all kinds of industries and business to reduce the economic impact and facilitate the recovery process. As we've seen, reopening is, is being much more difficult. I mean, uh, when I wrote the first, uh, this, this uh, presentation, it was only a couple of, let's say eight weeks into the COVID. And now we are already in September. so. We are almost a year into COVID if we take the, the first appearance. And uh, as it seems, the situation is not gonna change very quickly. So trucks are playing a huge important role. And uh, this is also a new normal. We will see much more traffic of our trucks and our roads. And uh, this is a eerie picture from a German highway where we see no cars, but lots of trucks. And that's a, that's a big challenge for our uh, concessionaires because in the concessions, it is the light vehicles that are actually paying the big tolls and uh, actually uh, subsidizing the, the truck traffic. So that's, that's, that's going to be a, a future challenge. So how the impact of the COVID will be? Well, we will have the social distance, uh, distancing, something we're experiencing right now. It will change the way we work, we purchase, relate with others, we travel. And um, basically the importance of effective online connectivity has, uh, has proven itself. Let's say, you know, in, uh, whatever we do, we, how we work, purchase, everything that can, will be done online. And this will not be for short term, it will, it's here to stay. And, um, Last not least, we have a huge uh, economic recession uh, of yet an uncertain proportion. So uh, if we look at some of the figures that are changing uh, basically daily, we're looking at a 5.2% 5 contraction of the world's global GDP in 2020. Uh, an economy as big as the United States shrank at nearly 33% annual rate between April and June. 2020, and uh, everybody in the United States is comparing this crisis to, to the crisis of uh, uh, the beginning of the 30s. Uh, also in Europe, uh, Europe is uh, facing the appearance of the second wave now. Uh, we heard about closing down again in Spain and uh, in England and in France. Uh, so um, the, the, the economic impact of 12% uh, is still to be seen if it, if it stays like that. Also in South America and Latin America, 10%. And it says that uh, the a study from the Cambridge University uh, estimates the total coronavirus cost to uh, a, a staggering number of 82 trillion over the next five years. So it's just uh, to give you a, a, a little bit over 
overview of what we're looking at. And we can actually see Angela Merkel to really think that that is a big mess and it is going to be expensive. Let's go over to pavement structure, which is what uh, we are interested in. Yeah, Kim, and, uh, before you go over, could you, uh, sorry about technical error, could you just make me the co-host or return host privileges to me so I can actually allow a number of persons? Excuse me, could, could, I didn't hear that. All right, so there, there are a number of persons waiting to join the room, but because you're a host and I unfortunately didn't make you co-host, they're, they're, they're not having access. So if you... Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, uh, admit all. There you go. Oh, I didn't know that. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, I know, I know. Yeah, go ahead. So let's wait a little bit so that it can get all admitted. Yes. So I see them. Yes, I see the number. Yeah, I see a lot of them. Sorry about that. Oh, it's not your fault. Actually, my error, because I should have made you a co-host rather than the host. So that was oh, actually okay. on my side. So they're all in now? Yeah, you could, you could go ahead. Um, if the only other thing I want you to do, if you make me host again, I'll make you a co-host. And that way, if anyone else is trying to get, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, how do I do that? I, I think you where do you see my name? Just go over my name, scroll to the right, and click that arrow for more, and then make me. Uh, Sorry, everyone, for the, the uh, pause. Click your name, uh, uh, more. Okay, there's more. Uh, make host or co host if you see the option there. Record, record, uh, share. No, oh, I don't see that. Uh, I don't share, compromise, optimize. It should, should be a drop down menu when you click the more, and it should indicate if you see either make host or. Make host. Okay, there it is. It's, it was different. Is that, does that work now? Not yet, but it should. Once you Do click. You, yes, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we're in business again. Okay. I need to make you co-host. You can you can go ahead if you if you're if you're able to. Okay, I uh, know I'm able to. I'm just I was just waiting for you. Go ahead. So everybody, uh, back again. Uh, uh, very warm welcome to everybody that wasn't allowed in. So we're just jumping. Uh, uh, into pavement structures themselves. So what are we looking at? And um, um, what are the available pavement structures we have nowadays? Uh, and, uh, basically, uh, on the left, we see a typical multi-layered pavement structure with a riding course, which is here, number five. It's, uh, that's a typical uh, uh, pavement structure, uh, as we could see everywhere in the world. While but this is not, this is actually a cut from a Roman a road built 2000 years ago. So, uh, and we look on the right side, uh, we look at the modern pavement structures shown on the right. Uh, actually not much has changed since Roman times. Uh, today, today, besides uh, granular base materials, which is a little way there, um, we, we haven't, uh, we have included two types of, uh, of, of uh, uh, pavement structures, which is hot mix asphalt, um, in 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 many in many possibilities, and concrete in a mix of both. Yeah. We have concrete on on hot mix asphalt, and we have asphalt on on concrete. But what uh, uh, is common to to all of the pavements of uh, the pavement structures we, we, we're looking at nowadays, or what we're actually using and what we're building and designing, is that they are continuously bound. And the question is, what is the mode of failure? The mode of failure is fatigue. And that is a very important aspect uh, to be considered, especially in, in, in connection to the BSM uh, uh, technology. And it's important to understand fatigue. So what is fatigue failure? Yeah? What, how does fatigue work? How does fatigue fail? This is the Morandi Bridge in Genova in July 2018, designed by Ricardo Morandi, yeah? built between 
1963 and uh, 1967. The bridge had been subject to controversies uh, from the very beginning and continued restoration work, uh, as I said, starting in the 70s. In April 2017, in face of the advanced state of deterioration, the bridge operator, its uh, company Autostrada, determined that urgent action was required and bidded it reconditioning, which was scheduled to start in the fall of 2018. So, on August 14th, 2018, that is a couple of weeks after this was bidded to be rebuilt, at 11.36 local time, a 210 meter section of the Morandi Bridge collapsed catastrophically and killed 43 people. And this picture dramatically shows one of the main underlying challenges of the world uh, network. When structures designed to fail by fatigue reach their design life, they risk a catastrophic failure, which is an accelerated and total failure from which no recovery is possible, making it necessary to replace the structure, hopefully before this happens. This is very important to, to consider for, for the next slides. Today, we have 18 million kilometers of paved road designed to fail by fatigue many of which have already exceeded the design line. Before uh, the, the Morandi Bridge, uh, I used to use this, uh, uh, this picture of the I-95 in Minneapolis. And um, uh, unfortunately, uh, this was 2017 when this bridge collapsed and also we had a, a lot of fatalities in, in that incident. The story here is that, um, what I'm trying to, to graphic here is that this is nothing new. Yeah? And uh, it's not something that is happening in underdeveloped or uh, developing countries, it's happening in the first world. And uh, while we're talking here about bridges, uh, which by the way are part uh, of the, uh, uh, road infrastructure, uh, the same applies to, to roads, because uh, uh, also roads fail catastrophically. We've always experienced a pothole that wasn't there the day before, it rained and we have a pothole there. And uh, I was uh, a witness, unfortunately, uh, in, in several times uh, to fatal car traffic accidents um, that were triggered by a catastrophic collapse of the uh, pavement in that section. So we think that uh, we will uh, have learned the, the lesson, but unfortunately it's not like that. Um, just uh, uh, what happens um, in uh, uh, the construction, uh, unfortunately, the reality shows us that uh, these warnings, uh, these bridges are warnings, uh, largely remain as a fool's errand. Only in Italy before the uh, collapse of the Morandi Bridge between 2016 and 2017, five other bridges collapsed. Uh, and thus, some after initial turmoil, this is business as usual, as confirmed by this picture of the bridge in Aula. Tuscany, Italy, which uh, catastrophically collapsed this year, April 8th. So this, this was actually uh, only a couple of months ago. So we will see further bridge collapses. Uh, and that shows that uh, the point I made in the, in the initial uh, slides of the presentation that our uh, internet, uh, world red network is in very bad condition. Let's go over to modular ratios. Besides fatigue and fatigue failure, modular ratios are the second important aspect and concept to be familiar with uh, to understand uh, uh, BSM materials. Um, when designing pavement structure, modular ratios allow us to better understand their performance over time and in many cases explain or allow us to avoid uh, the cause of premature failures. So what, is, what are modular ratios? The objective of a multi-layer uh, pavement as uh, shown in this picture here 
um, is to effectively distribute the traffic loads to the subgrade, which is a support condition given to us by uh, Mother Nature. So we have traffic, we have the subgrade here, and that's the support for. For pavement structure designs, an important mechanical material property is the resilient modulus. It's shown here on the right. Um, of, in, uh, which is basically an indicator of the rigid, uh, rigidity of the layer. The modular ratio is the relation of the modulus of one layer and of the immediately inferior layer. So we have a relationship uh, between these two layers. That is what is called the modular ratio. These are the moduli of each type of material, each layer, and the relation between uh, the two layers is the modular ratio. It's applied starting from the uh, given support. Yeah, we start always from the subgrade, uh, which is the subgrade. Yeah. The, the objective is to sign and build um, a, a, a balanced pavement structures that distributed, uh, distribute the stresses of the traffic loads to the interface between the subgrade and the pavement structure, avoiding the deformation of the subgrade. So we see here 100, 200, that's the modular ratio and we build it up there. And what we want here in this interface is a, an optimal stress distribution. And this is what we call a pavement that is in balance. In this uh, uh, next slide, I want to introduce the concepts of uh, maximum and effective modulus. Yeah, this is maximum stiffness here and effective stiffness. While layers of different materials have specific moduli, uh, here shown as maximum stiffness, this is the maximum stiffness of these different materials, uh, what determines the performance of a pavement structure are the effective moduli, here shown as effective stiffnesses. The modular ratio reflects the dependency between the modulus of a specific layer and the modulus of the underlying layer, as already said, in fact, of all underlying layers. So, as we can see, there is a, is a difference between the, the maximum stiffness, yeah, which is seen here, and the effective stiffness. And when we do the calculation, we see that uh, uh, due to the modular ratio, which is shown here, this is the maximum modular ratio allowed between these two materials. Um, we see that uh, in this case, uh, the effective stiffness that is actually that actually is in the pavement is below the maximum stiffness that material can achieve. And here we have the maximum stiffness here too, here too. But if we change the underlying condition, that means if we change or if nature changes the subgrade condition is that we have a poorer subgrade with a lower effective stiffness or modulus, we see that the impact is quite, quite, quite impressive. And we see that here, up to here, uh, none of the uh, uh, maximum stiffness values can be achieved. So, what does this do to us in, uh, in, 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 in in the, in, in the practical world. Yeah? As, as the title says, nature always searches for balances. So what happens when a pavement does not comply with the modular ratio rule? In this example, we have a hot mix asphalt layer, which is these two layers over here. We, we just take the, the thicker layer um, at 4,000 and megapascal with the maximum modulus. It has a maximum modulus of 4,000 megapascal and a modular ratio of three to five, uh, uh, three to five. Uh, the, uh, the, these hot mix asphalt layer uh, rests on a base layer with a modulus of 400 megapascal. And um, we see that there is a violation of the modular ratio of three to five, uh, five because uh, five, even five would be 2,000, yeah. So, uh, three would be, uh, let's say, 1,200. So, uh, uh, 4,000 is, uh, is way beyond uh, the, the, the modular ratio. And the impact that has is that it would look nice when you build it, but very quickly, very quickly, 
the result of an unbalanced structure subject to traffic loads will suffer an accelerated deterioration until the modular ratio rule is met. This is very similar to the catastrophic failure. So you see that very quickly um, the, 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 the cracks appear and that's an accelerated, uh, we can call it catastrophic failure until the balance and the modular ratio here is, is full, is right in between the, the allowed uh, three to five is achieved. Uh, we now have a balanced but destroyed pavement. Nature uh, 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 seeks equilibrium, this is important, yeah? and not complying with the natural law of modular ratios when designing pavement structures has dire consequences. So if we look at the here, just some numbers of, uh, of, of modular, uh, uh, modulus and modular ratios, and we can see that the, one of the interesting aspects of bitumen stabilized materials is that the modular ratio is uh, rather close to, to, to what we have uh, in actually in, 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 in hot mix asphalts and in continuously bound materials. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, we get uh, pretty high uh, 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 stiffnesses, maximum uh, mod uh, modular. Uh, modular. So now let's jump over to general concepts uh, of the BSM technologies, which is bitumen stabilized materials. Yeah. So what are they? They're granular materials treated stabilized, and that's the that's the word, that's why we, we go in BSM stabilized with bitumen in two forms. It can be foam. Uh, and it can be emulsion. We will concentrate here on, on the foam. Yeah. Both the foam and the emulsion are just uh, uh, means, it's there, the means to bring in the, uh, the, the, the bitumen to the mix. What they are not is hot mix asphalt. And this is uh, maybe very important is to get everything uh, that has to do, every, every test, every uh, uh, rule, that applies to hot mix asphalt, it doesn't apply to foam, uh, to uh, BSMs. So let's uh, be a, a little bit more uh, in detail in what the foam uh, bitumen is. And foam bitumen is uh, uh, basically a, a steam, yeah, with bubbles of steam with, uh, 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 with a very thin uh, film of bitumen. And what determines the foam quality uh, is uh, the bitumen type, the temperatures, uh, bitumen pressure, the dispersion of the water for the processing, uh, uh, for the foaming process. So how do we, how do we produce, uh, produce those things? So the important thing is that this is produced on site. It is, it is actually, uh, this process actually takes place inside the equipment uh, that's used on the job site. So we have uh, uh, 150 uh, bitumen, 98 parts, 175 degrees. That's the seven, same uh, temperature you need for the, for the uh, uh, asphalt in the asphalt plant at the pressure of three bars in, a, in, in what we call a a uh, 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 foam bar, and that uh, is, uh, you know, press, uh, pressed into an expansion chamber, and here mixed with two parts of water, a little bit air to, to really uh, uh, guarantee uh, the distribution of the water particles. And um, at the moment, the, 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 the water collides, the water particle collides with a hot bitumen particle, uh, the water immediately explosively changes into uh, foam, um, they change their state from liquid to vaporous, which is uh, accompanied by a, an a expansion of 1,500 times. And uh, we, voila, we have the foam that is spit out by the, uh, by the nozzle at the bottom of the chamber. And as you can see, that's the reason we need the 175 degrees. This, this foam, uh, bitumen foam, uh, 
uh, is 100 degrees. So we need, uh, we have already kind of used uh, uh, 75 degrees uh, for, the, for the process and uh, for the process of changing water into steam. Uh, and uh, it would not work at 160, 150, 140. It would not have enough energy to, to do that process of changing uh, the state. So now we have this bubble, uh, as we said before, uh, this uh, bubble with steam inside and, and bitumen film. It hits uh, a granular uh, part of a particle, a coarse particle in our granular materials uh, at temperature of uh, 20 degrees, plus minus 10 degrees, uh, ambient temperature. And as we said, these little, it explodes into thousands of micro droplets uh, of bitumen. It's little bitumen droplets, pure bitumen. There's nothing that has changed it. You know, this is a pure physical process of forming. Yeah? So this is exactly the same bitumen with exactly the same characteristics that uh, was uh, uh, used at the very beginning of the process. These uh, little micro droplets are 100 uh, plus minus 100 degrees, and they cannot interact with the uh, with the coarse materials. Yeah? They don't have enough energy to do that. What they do, they interact with the finer uh, uh, portion of the of the mix, the minus 200 mesh, and they interact with the humidity that involves these uh, the fine particles. So they basically coat the fines. And they create, and through that, what they do, they create, a, 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 they create kind of a matrix, a viscoelastic matrix, as seen in, in this picture here. Yeah, um, and that what happens is, uh, without uh, having been uh, coat, coating the large particles in this case. Um, the foam bitumen mixes, uh, the, the bitumen, even at, at higher percentages, like this is 3.5, this is what it looks like, yeah, 3.5% uh, bitumen. I could put in 6% bitumen here and it would not change color. So I, I don't, one of the things I don't get with the BSMs is the black color uh, hot mix asphalt uh, uh, people like so much because uh, it, there is no coating of the coarse particles. We see here, the uh, the distribution of these micro droplets. This is these are the fines, and uh, uh, inside uh, uh, the the mix. The objective of the BSM mixes is not, the, as I said, the involvement of the coarse packet, but a homogeneous distribution of all these little droplets all over the the in the, in the mix. Yeah, and as a construction material. Uh, the compacted, it, it starts acting when it's compacted. The BSM offers uh, excellent bearing capacity and stress performance. Yeah? This is an inert material until it is compacted. For that, uh, the compaction is a very important uh, uh, part of the process. Important that this is a discontinuous bound. Yeah? So if you look the analogy, uh, it is not like a, a welding, yeah? it's, not a, it's not a continuous uh, bound like in asphalt concrete or in cemented, uh, uh, cement treated bases. We have a discontinuous bound, much similar like uh, you would have it uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in spot welding. You have uh, millions of spot welds uh, um, next to each other. So what is the technical, what's, what's actually happened here? What, what, what have we learned in the last, let's say 30 years we've been looking at this technology. If you take a, a graded crushed stone, um, what is the effect uh, uh, of stabilizing uh, this material with foam bitumen? You know? we, if we take this graded uh, crushed stone and um, subject it to a, a, a uh, a, a, a test, then we will get the, the cohesion of 30 to uh, 55 kilopascal and an internal uh, friction angle of 43 to 51 degrees. So now let's add, maintaining the same density and moisture content, 2.2% 2 .2, uh, 2 .2 bitumen and 0.7% cement. 
nothing else. And voila, we see that we have maintained uh, the angle of friction, and but the cohesion has gone to the roof. And that is where the, the that is where the whole uh, secret lies. Yeah. So if we take our column uh, 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 envelopes, what has happened basically is that uh, uh, the, in the graph, the effect of the stabilization of uh, with bitumen foam of the granular material is the displacement as you've seen uh, of the failure envelope curve up uh, to, to, uh, to a higher level. So, um, that explains the, 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 the behavior of these materials. So now going, coming back to the mode of failure, the mode of failure is very similar to the mode of failure of uh, uh, ba uh, 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 base materials. Uh, the same principle to granular materials, such as analysis of stress states and a permanent deformation mode of failure. So, this, this is uh, treated much like uh, uh, granular materials. With uh, simple monotonic uh, triaxial tests, we do simple monotonic triaxial tests uh, and that are actually very easy to perform nowadays. Um, uh, you, uh, you go and you determine the deviator stress ratio, which is determined by uh, the ratio of the applied deviator stress uh, to the uh, uh, failure deviator stress expressed as a percentage. Yeah? You have here the failure envelope and we uh, take the, the relation between the, the two deviator stresses. Um, this is then calculated and uh, the ratio is fed into a, a software, a pavement design software, for example, Rubicon software and via transfer function which also takes a, uh, in account li uh, design life criteria uh, uh, as the permanent deformation, rut depths, and re reliability. Basically, we, we, we design for a deformation of 10 millimeters uh, with a reliability of 95%, which means that 5% that of my structure uh, will be deformed by a maximum of 10 millimeters uh, uh, at the end of the uh, of the design life, um, but just in the uh, in the the, uh, the outer uh, wheel path of the of the heavy side. Yeah? So that would look like uh, yeah, that here. So that is that is the design criterion. Ten millimeters BSM condition at failure. So if we go back to uh, the structural analysis, uh, let's, con let's, let's uh, compare what we have. This is hot mix asphalt, but could also be uh, concrete on the left side, which are all continuously bound layers. And uh, we know that under load, uh, the continuously bound layers, as we said, they are subject to fatigue, fatigue cracking from the bottom up. And uh, if we go to the BSMs, as we said, they behave like granular materials. They are stress states. We are subject to stress states. And we're looking at continuous, discontinuous bond. And the mode of failure is permanent deformation. The important difference is that at the end of the design life, uh, the continuously bound structure is destroyed and uh, must be replaced. While the discontinuously bound uh, BSM structure is permanently deformed, denser, if you want to call it like that, it is denser than before, it does not need to be replaced. And that uh, is uh, something that uh, has a, a huge impact on uh, the economics and also on everything we said at the beginning on, uh, uh, on, on the environmental impact uh, and so on. Um, as I said, the, the latter, that uh, the BSM structure is not destroyed but deformed, especially important when we compare life cycle costs for rehabilitation options, as we have here. Yeah. The objective of this example is to compare orders of magnitude yeah, of life cycle costs and energy consumption of the shown alternatives. 
The pavement structure to the left here needs uh, uh, rehabilitation with a target service life of 300 million easels. That's approximately 20 years. And we have four options uh, that are being evaluated. Mill and replace, um, patching and includes patching, asphalt surfacing, reconstruction, which is a full reconstruction, full rework, full replacement. Then we have the South African inverted pavement where we stabilize the existing structure with cement as the CTB here. And on top of that, uh, we uh, have a granular layer of high quality, which is a, a granular uh, layer, and, and that has to be covered with, uh, with the asphalt as well. Uh, and uh, the, the last here to the right is uh, the existing structure, uh, stabilize the existing, existing structure with BSM. Uh, and uh, cover it with a UTFC, which is an ultra thin friction course. This is no has no no structural uh, properties. It's just to to protect uh, and the the underlying layer and uh, for riding quality. So, what happens if we look at the different uh, values? The upper percentage, if we look at, is indicates the cost increase of each option relative to the BSM alternative. So that would mean that the overlay is 88% uh, more expensive than if I apply the, 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 the BSM uh, stabilization alternatives or look to uh, the lower percentage is a savings. Uh, if, if, I, if, I, if I look at, at an overlay and I trade the overlay in for the BSM, I would save almost 50%. And the same applies here to the to the energy. So it means that uh, I would say it's 37 percent uh, uh, percent of energy, uh, and that is important in terms of CO2, as we said. And uh, it's 58 percent more energy consuming uh, in comparison to uh, the uh, uh, foam bitumen or BSM alternative. What is actually interesting is that. Also, the CTB, which is a cement treated base, especially the production of cement, is, is very uh, CO2 and energy consuming. So, it is, it is it's came to a surprise to us. This is, these are numbers that we have compiled from a lot of projects. As I said, these are orders of magnitude, uh, not, not, the, not, not, not to be uh, concentrated on the exact numbers, but it's, it's kind of a surprise that the CTB is, uh, in terms of uh, environmental impact is probably the, the least uh, uh, suitable solution. So uh, if we go uh, to the conclusions, um, designing, building and maintaining uh, continuously bound pavement structures subject to fatigue failures uh, has important economic, functional and environmental downsides which much, uh, much of the worldwide uh, road network in dire condition and the need of rehabilitation, the necessity to consider alternatives to continuously, continuous bound structures subject to fatigue is critical. COVID-19 will have an impact on road construction, last not least on the budgets, forcing many countries to look for more economic alternatives without sacrificing quality. Bitumen stabilized materials allow the design and construction of thick homogeneous layers with excellent load bearing capacity and considerable economic and environmental advantages. While continuously bound structures need replacement after reaching their design life, BSM structures can be reutilized continuously with minimum interventions. The BSM technology is a proven technology successfully applied worldwide in thousands of built kilometers, but as any technology, it is a technology in development and the experiences from the field and continuous research allow us to better understand it and to optimize its application. And here I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, there is a lot of uh, information, yeah, detailed information and uh, or maybe Jose Luis Magallana afterwards can give you uh, his contact uh, data um, that uh, uh, really explains this in detail uh, and all the, the specifics. How do you perform 
the triaxial tests uh, and all the other aspects of, of this technology. Uh, and there's also uh, how do you do the different equipments you, you can use in this technology. And um, uh, this is just an in, in, in introduction, as I said at the beginning, just to, to give you the flavor. And if there is more interest, then please uh, contact Press and Seal. Uh, or you can also contact myself through the university. So um, having said that, uh, I thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, all stay safe and most of all, stay healthy. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Joachim. Um, very excellent presentation as normal. The, there are a few questions, and I will start with the easier one. In our midst, we have a number of students, and as a result, they will have certain questions that maybe more experts person might find a little less or more clear clarity on. One of the questions is: they said they couldn't, they didn't catch the idea between or the distinction between continuous and discontinuous bones. So, if you could clarify that, but a little bit further than that, also. Um, are we able to determine how much deformation will occur over the lifetime of the structure? Those are two other questions that are coming forward at this point. And then I'll okay, uh, let's go to the uh, difference be between discontinuous and continuous bond. If you take two plates of steel, two plates of steel, and you want to join these two plates of steel, and let's say you want to join them to resist the traction force that is, that is a given force. So you can do it by two different means. You can do a continuous welding seam. Yeah? You can do a continuous welding seam and you can weld these two plates with the continuous welding seam together. Okay? So you have the two plates welded together and you need a, 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 a specific amount of force to, to tear them apart. Uh, what happens if you induce a crack anywhere in the seam? Anywhere in the seam that is between the two uh, plates. That crack will propagate. That is a fatigue crack. And it propagates because what we call the Paris law. That means that in a crack you have concentrations of, uh, of tensions uh, and uh, of stresses uh, and, and that will propagate and run through the, run through the, through the whole uh, uh, seam until the seam is no more a seam and it's broken and the two plates fall apart. Now, what is a discontinuously bound uh, uh, system? You take the exactly two, the same two plates and you weld them together with millions of spot welds, okay? Millions of spot welds. What is the difference? If I cut one or two spot welds, nothing happens because there is no connection between the spot welds. There cannot be stress concentrations. I can even cut three or four spot welds next to each other and the plates would still stick together. Yeah, that, that is a very, let's say, it, it doesn't really, you know, go to the point of the deformation, which I will go now, but this is how you explain what is the difference between a discontinuous uh, uh, binding and a, uh, and a continuous binding. Continuously bound materials, all the particles are in connection with each other. Yeah, discontinuously, there, are not, there is no connection. So what happens to one particle does not affect uh, the whole uh, 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 structure. Okay, that's the first point. The second one was about deformation. Right. Second part of it had to do with um, to determine how do we, are we able to determine how much deformation will occur over the lifetime of the structure. Yeah, okay. This is, uh, uh, I mean, this goes... Uh, this goes to the, to the slide which I showed with these column more uh, 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 circles. Yeah? Uh, what you do in, 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 in uh, um, you cannot apply as we are looking at the different type of material uh, at the beginning when this was studied by the Stellenbosch University, the University of Davies, uh, University uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they were looking at ways and how to determine exactly that question, uh, how do we can determine the deformation? So what they do is they use the same concept they use for base uh, layers. Base layers, what, how do base layers fail? 
base layers fail through deformation. Yeah, I mean, this, this, they, 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 and, and what is the deformation of a base layer? Is a, is a, is a higher density. Yeah? We all have uh, uh, base layers or sections of roads. We all know sections of roads that have been there for ages, 30, 50, 60, 70 years for whatever reason, you know, I mean, they didn't suffer, uh, but they were under traffic, heavy traffic. They were, they were properly built and, and we see some deformation. Yeah, this is, but that is a different deformation like displacement, like you see in rutting and asphalt. It is a deformation that means that the layer of the materials is denser. Uh, the particles are packed denser. So what you do in BSMs, you, uh, you do the triaxial tests. And um, through the triaxial tests, as we said, uh, you uh, uh, create the failure envelope. And uh, um, as I showed very, very briefly in one of the pictures, uh, we uh, determine the, uh, the, the deviator stress uh, and the deviator stress relationship. Uh, 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 the effective one we want and the one at failure. And we all redesign with 35%. That means we are only at 35% of the failure envelope. Yeah, We're much below. Yeah, And uh, um, that uh, back calculation gives me what, what I said, uh, a deformation, because this is then modeled, as I said, in, in software like Rubicon. And uh, these software, they model the deformation inside each structure. And, and, and I give the model the, the, the maximum deformation I, 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 I accept, it's in this case, 10 millimeters. And, and that is the, 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 the design criterion I have. Yeah. The design criterion for 20 million standard axles on a, on a, on a, on a traditional road with Hard mixed asphalt would be that the cracks, the fatigue cracks, appear at the surface. That's the design criteria. If this happens after 20 million uh, axles, uh, e cells have gone over that road, the road was built properly and the, 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 the design was a success. The cracks are appearing on at the surface. So, uh, and the other way out, if I have a 10%, uh, if I have a 10%, maximum 10% deformation and 5% of the road, I've met the 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 uh, uh, the design criteria. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much for that, Joachim. Um, hopefully that clarifies the issue. If there are any more, as you mentioned, there's a lot of data available um, and content which we at the university will acquire and we will provide and disseminate for those who are interested. Please make a request and we'll find a way to get that out to you as well. So now we want to hand over to Lawrence Bridmohan who is a regional uh, material stabilization consultant and has been working in Trinidad mainly, but in also throughout the region. And he'll bring some more Caribbean perspective on matter and some of the challenges we may have here in the local context. All right, so over to you, Lawrence. Oh, just before you come in, Lawrence, there are a few others who had mentioned questions, such as Brandon Fraser. We'll take your questions at the end. So. Please bear with us as we go forward, just to ensure we get all the presentations out. All right, go ahead, Brian. Um, Lawrence. Okay. Yeah, I think I'll have to be co-host now. The option for co-host is not there. I'm only seeing an option for host, but I'll just make you host just to allow things to okay. smooth. So thank you, Dr. Ellis. Uh, my name is Lawrence Bidwan, and I'll be presenting today on foam bitumen stabilized materials, its applications, as well as to highlight its potential as a sustainable pavement solution. Just for a bit of background, the foam bitumen stabilization technology has been utilized within the industry and within the region uh, for just over a decade. This uh, initiative was as a result of combined efforts by a Trinidadian contractor, Danny's Enterprises, the late senior pavement lecturer at the UWI St. Davidson, Mr. Raymond Charles, engineer Cecil Chin, as well as assisted by Mr. Mike Marshall, Wojian Group, Ms. Ansel Incorporated, 
as well as South African stabilized pavement specialists, Mr. Collins and Professor Kim Jenkins, all of the Loudoun group. Fortunately for me, I have been involved in the technology uh, since its introduction in the region at various levels. Now I'm actually involved in, in academic research, design and construction, and look forward to sharing some of our experiences within the region with the use of the technology. So although we, a lot has changed since the first automobiles and early road construction, it is clear that our road networks continue to play a critical role in the movement of our people, goods, and services. In this light, these road infrastructure need to be adequately constructed and rehabilitated to maintain efficiency and serviceability. In addition, as we now adjust to life with a COVID-19 pandemic, we are now all forced to adjust to what has become a new normal and required to now transition towards making life a better normal. As it relates to pavement engineering and the road building and rehabilitation industry, we are now being forced to embrace innovation, sustainable pavement practices, as well as employing employing our pavement solutions of economically advantageous solutions. Okay, so when we examine the, the layers within our existing flexible pavement systems, it is evident that a lot of our flexible pavement systems, our major components are the aggregate layers. These aggregate layers are responsible for accommodating the imposed loading from our vehicular traffic and as such are required to have a specific strength and stiffness properties to resist stresses and strain and allow this to be dissipated to an acceptable level on our lower layers within the pavement structure. Uh, as a result, because of increasing infrastructural development, there's a continuous demand for quality pavement aggregates. But when we consider this demand, however, there are company concerns with quarrying and vegan supplies, environmental degradation, and for the import importation option, there's also challenges with respect to foreign exchange availability. Fortunately, the foam bitumen stabilization technology has allowed for the enhancement of our available materials. It allows for the construction of durable pavement structures, as well as allowing for pavement structures of increased repetitive load carrying capacity, all in all an effective, cost-effective, sustainable pavement solution. So what is foam bitumen? Foam bitumen actually is produced when hot bitumen comes in contact with cold water in the presence of pressurized air. It's actually a reduced state, a temporary state of reduced bitumen viscosity that allows this foam bitumen to cool the finer particles within our parent aggregates. The result upon mixing with the aggregate is production of what we refer to as a bitumen stabilized material. Upon compaction, this material, uh, the fine particles and the foam bitumen produce mastic, joins the uncoated coarse aggregate at specific points. As such, the bitumen stabilized materials are characteristic of an uncoated coarse aggregate with the filler mastic at the contact points. And essentially, uh, what results is a material with maintained granular interlock, similar to an onboard aggregate material, but with a significantly increased cohesion, and as a result, an increased shear strength. Now, I know a question was asked earlier. So this slide actually uh, is actually intended to assist in distinguishing between what we uh, probably uh, accustomed to, which is the asphaltic concrete, and which is bound as opposed to what we refer to as a non continuously bound bitumen stabilized material. The significant difference between the two is that the material, the bitumen stabilized material, is actually um, characteristic of the uncoated aggregates, which are bound only at specific spots by the bitumen plastic. When you compare this to the fully bound asphaltic concrete, the bitumen cement material as a result is not black and does not feel as tacky as an asphaltic concrete would. 
um, in addition, when you consider the stress distribution under loading for an uh, bituminous stabilized material, it actually uh, reflects that of a granular material, which is consistent of a cone shaped stress pattern and permanent deformation being the dominant distress response of this material. This is compared to the bound asphaltic material, which has a predominant, predominant sorry, fatigue cracking response. So before bituminous stabilization technology was introduced in China, through the cool in place recycling technique as an attractive uh, pavement rehabilitation solution. At the time, it allowed for economic and environmental benefits. With the introduction of technology and advancements in technology level, the coal implant recycling option now allows for the addressing concerns with respect to availability of our aggregate materials, as well as its suitability. The coal implant recycling option allows for the control blending of our available aggregates it allows for a paver laid application of increased efficiency and provides for economic and environmental benefits, a sustainable pavement solution. Later in this presentation, I'll actually touch on a couple of applications where we continue to use the coal and plant recycling to address concerns with respect to material availability and suitability in Trinidad. So a lot of the success with the foam bitumen stabilization technology within the region to date is as a result of the employing of proper mixed design and structural design processes. When we consider mixed design, a recipe based mixed design methodology is adopted in and followed and in accordance with guidelines from a, a specified global established guidelines into the mixing and design of these materials determine the strengths. Uh, consistent with these are the determination of the parent aggregate characteristics, blending of the aggregate materials, and determination of the optimal foam bitumen active for the contents. Stabilized material strength testing is therefore used to determine the classification of the materials and its inputs into the structural design models. So formulations consist are uh, produced during the design process consisting of aggregate materials of unknown of known aggregate properties, water, foam bitumen, and active filler contents. These are used and investigated in the material design process. The design process, mix design process, also utilizes equipment that are capable of replicating that produced from the specialist construction machines. If you look at the first photograph to the left on top, uh, that's actually a foaming bitumen, foam bitumen laboratory unit, which replicates what is produced on the large construction machines, as well as a polymer mixer, which also um, replicates, in addition to the vibratory compaction hammer, the large construction machines. The, these, mach these machines are utilized to create laboratory specimens that are used to determine the strength properties and input into the structural design methods. Well, this is actually an example of a uh, mixed design formulation um, process that was carried out. In this particular example, this is actually research that was done on an available custom material that was marginally um, was, was on a degree to be included in current mix design. In this actual research, we were able to mix foam bitumen and uh, active filler with the material. And you can see from this that the cohesion actually tripled, or probably four times was that larger than the original material. This resulted in an increased shear strength in the material. This research is actually one which has um, born applications in some of the applications in Trinidad and Tobago and is intended to probably address some of the concerns with the aggregate materials suitability and availability in Trinidad. So in addition to the mix design process, we also have a structural design process which we also need to follow. So um, significant to this 
is the pavement investigation that we usually do to determine the existing site conditions and support conditions. So photograph to the top left will identify whether the test pitch, which we actually sample the materials in there to determine the support. There's actually use of uh, ground paint generator to determine the homogeneity of materials within. We actually take core samples, but we also need to determine was the available support of the existing structure if we need to rehabilitate or even if we need to construct. So the, the structural design process involves a pavement investigation process and a structural design modeling process that works hand in hand with the material design process. So this slide uh, aims to highlight the typical structural capacity comparison. So if you were to consider two um, pavement structures, a conventional and a stabilized pavement structure, if you were to substitute a stabilized layer, a bitumen stabilized layer, which will be called a bitumen stabilized material number one, KMA, if you were to substitute equivalent thickness or an equivalent support, we can actually see the stabilized structure having an increase in the carrying capacity of the structure, almost triple in just with the substitution with an equivalent thickness um, which is a stabilized material. Layer. This is as a result of the increased carrying capacity of the which is a stabilized material, allowing for the use of a stabilized structure. This is the conventional granular structure. Similarly, this slide aims to highlight a uh, thickness comparison between uh, 11.5 million cell capacity conventional granular base layer, uh, base structure, sorry. So you could see the structure consists of a CBR5 support, uh, 300 mm fill, 200 CBR30 sub base, 200 uh, CBR80 custom base, and 100 mm thick asphalt. If we were to model equivalent carrying capacity structure using stabilized materials. You could see that with the use of uh, granules of the substitution of the bitumen stabilized base, we're able to increase, well, match the carrying capacity of the material, of the structure, sorry, as well as eliminate this asphaltic layer in the structure. This allows for material savings, which range between 10 to 20% in many instances. So when we talk about the KMA in plant stabilization methodology, one of the major advantages of the methodology is allows for the use of an asphalt paver application. So in, in essence, the, the technology itself, the implant technology allows for controlled processing, allowing for the production of a material of improved consistency and a quality aggregate. It allows for improved rate control with the use of the asphalt paver improved efficiency and additional compactive effort from the paper scrapes. But in addition to the use of asphalt pavers for its installation, we also utilize the conventional construction machines provided that the methodology, storage handling and methodology used for the installation are within the required guidelines. So the technology has been used both in pavement construction in some of the heavily trafficked roads, as well as pavement rehabilitation. So this is actually a stabilized pavement construction application that I want to highlight. In this application, the conventional structure consisted of a uh, sand capping layer, the sub base, a uh, granular sub base, and a granular crushstone base, and a thick asphalt layer. When we looked at the carrying capacity of this um, conventional aggregate pavement structure, we were able to propose to the client that the use of a cement stabilized implant sub base, a reduced thickness BSM crushed stone base, and was able to carry a uh, uh, superior number of um, repetitive loading, as well as allowing for a reduction any hot, hot mix asphalt concrete uh, layer. Overall, this structure allowed for the use of a thinner HMA layer, a thinner structural base layer, but significantly it allowed for elimination of the base layer dual grid above the sub base, allowing for significant savings to the clients. 
In a sense, it allowed for a stiffer CSM or base support and a high strength PSM base. It was, in sense, essence, an economical, durable, balanced payment structure. So, when we look at the construction methodology that we would have implemented on this project, the, the drill grid that was uh, below the sand capping layer was installed, and conventional um, equipment we used to install the sand capping layer. The, both the implant cement stabilized sub base and implant bitumen stabilized base were produced um, in plant using the KMA plant and they were laid using the asphalt beam to the required grades and with improved efficiency. So just to walk you through the project, uh, this is actually the installation of the sand capping layer, which we would have done. The use of a KMA um, 220 mobile mixing plant, recycling plant, and the installation of the sub base and base layers using the asphalt paper. This is a finished uh, bitumen stabilized material um, base layer. This is another section of this um, same project. This is the closeness surface that we were able to obtain after rolling the bitumen stabilized base. And this actually shows the bitumen stabilized base and a weight in asphaltic concrete surface. So this project has actually been completed I believe about a year and a half ago or so and it's being, um, it's being in service and we're actually monitoring to see uh, how, how it performs. So having identified an actual construction, road construction application, this slide and this project being highlighted is a pavement rehabilitation method, um, application, sorry, using the KMA implant stabilization. So this scope for this project involved the, um, the strengthening of the existing carriageway, but also there was need for a bit of deep layer um, stabilization because of the structural effects that we were observing. So we proposed to the client to, so we proposed to the client to remove the existing asphaltic concrete um, layers. So we milled that using a cool machine. In the areas that required this deep treatment, we would have used a cool and paste recycler. At the same time, this material was taken to the plants that was milled off previously. It was treated and brought back to site upon completion of the in place deep stabilization, all in one night. And we were able to install back this, um, this which may stabilize wrap layer in order for traffic to be accommodated at the end of the night's work. So we actually we have been to this in sections, I believe for about a week or so. And this actually shows a uh, bitumen stabilized uh, layer in service while we were constructing. So it allowed for traffic to run um, uninterruptedly on the surface. So this, this actually works through the project. This was the photos before the project. This was the installed bitumen stabilized base layer. That was open to traffic um, before we resurfaced. This actually was open for a week before we surfaced. And this is a finished product of this, this um, application. In addition to rules, we have also used the application in some industrial areas. In this particular application, the client wanted to strengthen existing um, infrastructure we had, as well as provide a new network for accessing the site for his pipe storage um, operations. So we would have determined the existing site support conditions. In this application, we were able to take the plant to the site. So this was actually an advantage. If the plant was carried to site, produce the um, bitumen stabilized material. We would have treated the saw base with, in place using a cement stabilized methodology. And at the end, we were able to in install the table laid bitumen stabilized base, which is currently the operating service of this facility and is performing well based on the feedback that we have gotten from the client as it provides a lot more advantages in terms of maintenance and uh, durability as opposed to a crush stone base which would have been the alternative and the original design for this facility. So in addition to root construction and so on, this and, re and rehabilitation, this it was still the technology is identified in this application. So in this particular application, we are able to, to execute stabilized um, road widening 
In this design, we were able to propose to the clients a stabilized structure with, similar to the one previously where we donated geogrid and we used the asphalt thickness for the clients, allowing for economic savings. So we would have installed these um, the stabilized materials, stabilized layers using the conventional equipment. We would have used our conventional rollers and so on to install it. This is the finished product of this, um, this application. So in addition to roads, we have also used the application in terms of housing pavement infrastructure. This is an upgrade to an existing um, housing development in road infrastructure. And we've also included it in construction and rehabilitation of car parks and parking lots. So in conclusion, I just want to re-emphasize that the stabilization technology allows for the enhancement of all available materials. It reduces demand for quality fujin aggregates and large sums of these materials. Because of the controlled processing, it allows for monitored quality. In addition, it allows for an economical durable construction of low carrying capacity, increased low carrying capacity pavement structures. It also allows for reduced rehabilitation costs at the end of the design course, design life. In essence, it provides the potential for sustainable applications in the region as we have seen in Trinidad today. So I do thank you for the time and we welcome any questions that you may have. All right. Thank you very much again, Lawrence. You can first and foremost make me host again. All right. Second to that, there are a few questions that came forward and most are very impressed with what has been said. I'll throw out the question to Yahib before. Um, one of the questions was the unbalanced section didn't crack as the presentation had indicated, but the ones close to or within the modular ratio did. And they want to know why is this? Was it because of the nature um, couldn't find a balance or was there some other reason? Hopefully you can relate to that question. Yeah, Kim? Yeah, I, I need to figure out how to... Well, I'll on, on meet, meet you. Okay. If you cannot... You should be able to do it himself, but have you made me? How do I, how do I transfer those up there? Where? You're gonna click to find my name, click on more, and then scroll down to where it says me post. Uh, Layton? Yes, you go. Uh, to be fair, I think I saw that question posted earlier during the first presentation, so I think it may be more relevant to that presentation. No, no, it is. That's that's what I'm saying. So I'm trying to answer the question, but his mic was muted. All right. Yeah. It, 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 I didn't. I was confused with the. Don't worry, uh, I can repeat the question. Let me just repeat the question, please. Sure. So the question is: in in the presentation, you'd have indicated that the you had some diagram that showed the unbalanced section that it okay. did crack. And they wanted to know, but the one that was closer to or within the modular ratio did, and they want to know why is this the case? Is it because of nature or was there something else that, that caused that? Okay, now this is, uh, this is uh, the reason why I focused on these, uh, let's say three or four topics, among them the modular ratio. The modular ratio is a nature of law. It's, it's nothing more like, uh, you cannot put a, a glass play, a pane on a feather bed. So if you build something on an unsound, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, support, uh, you, don't, you won't get the results out of it. We have all seen uh, pavements, that uh, asphalt pavements. I've even seen thick asphalt pavements, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters of asphalt pavement, hot mix asphalt pavements, beautiful hot mix asphalt pavements. Last six months. Six months, it was completely cracked. So the question is why? And the question is the modular ratio. Because if I built uh, an asphalt layer or a concrete layer uh, with a modular ratio uh, of, as I said, three to five, and it can have, I don't know, uh, 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 five, X thousand, 5,000 megapascal of, uh, 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 of modulus. But if the underlying layer the underlying layer, the directly underlying layer under the asphalt, uh, uh, has is is has a is has a is a weaker layer. Then I have to multiply this uh, this modular ratio of the underlying uh, layer uh, with this modular ratio three to five, 
And what happens is, uh, that is what we see all over the place, is that we see roads failing too early. Yeah? And this is because the, regular, the modular ratio is not being complied with. Uh, you go to projects all over the world, all over the world, and you say, I have a 100 kilometer project. I've seen it many times. And you say, okay, what's the design? It's the same design for 100 kilometers. So how is that possible that in 100 kilometers, the subgrade has the same modulus for 100 kilometers? And as we saw in the, in the slides I showed, it's the subgrade, and this is major nature, that dictates what happens on top. So mm -hmm. it's no wonder that if in certain sections, we keep wondering, hey, everything was done correctly. Yeah? We have beautiful material. We paved it with the best equipment in the world. It doesn't help you. Yeah, and I've, I've, I've been posed that question many times. We have something underneath we know is bad. How do we fix this road? It keeps failing, yeah? Sao Paulo, the huge highway in Sao Paulo is a good example of that. We have a full presentation of that and uh, Jose Luis can share that with you most probably. Uh, and, and, you know, there is just no uh, uh, magic uh, bullet. You have to uh, comply with the rules and the rules of nature. So if you don't do that, and if you uh, consider that a 100 kilometer uh, long road project has the same underlying uh, CBR or call it a modulus in the subgrade, uh, you're just uh, cheating yourself yeah? and you're shooting yourself in the foot. So what is going to happen in certain sections, as I said, where the, the, the CBR maybe drops half, then you will have a problem if you have the same uh, concept on top. And what will happen to your uh, uh, to your continuously bound materials, be it cement, uh, concrete, or hot mix asphalt, they will fail much quicker. They will, f they will have an accelerated deterioration. And in, any case, in some cases, they will have catastrophic failures as the bridges. Now they will just fail. So it, it, sometimes it's a, it's a surprise to people that uh, uh, people come to a road that was constructed three years ago, it's full of cracks. Yeah. So, Let's check what is underneath. And that's the reason I said, if you understand the modular ratio, you can understand uh, uh, how to avoid and uh, how to explain also uh, these premature failures. Yeah. And, 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 and coming back to the unbalanced and balance, uh, nature seeks balance. So if something is unbalanced and a hot mix asphalt by, by definition is unbalanced because it is the, 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 the nature says it has to crack. So why are these pavements, uh, even if they're constructed properly, and the, all the rules are kept at the end of the lifetime, yeah? at the end of the design life, a pavement uh, bound, uh, continuously bound pavement will be cracked. It will be destroyed. That's the nature of the beast. Yeah? So uh, if we understand that a bridge will collapse sometimes, it is built uh, for a certain uh, uh, dynamic, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 loads. Mm -hmm. So if I if I get a, if if I put a hundred trucks on that bridge and maybe there's some security on it, okay, I can put a thousand on that. But there will be one truck too much, too many, yeah. And that will be the truck that creates these catastrophic uh, collapses we've seen all over the world and we still see. Right. And that is when you when nature goes in balance. Yeah, nature goes in balance because the bridge is unbalanced. So nature goes in balance. Boom, the bridge falls down. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much for that response. Um, question to you, Lawrence. Um, what is if if there if not then um, you can you could answer what is the comparison of the initial cost of BSM to that of the alternative using let's say asphalt. But well, what's what's that comparison? So let's say a contractor is interested. Um, how is there, is there a comparison in that sense? It's costing more initially, it's costing less. What's the benefit in that sense? Okay, so we need to, if we want to consider costs as you would have in our know, applications, but now we, we consider costs over the entire pavement structure because what, what the um, stabilization technology allows, it allows for the enhancement of a layer. But when we look, the cost actually comes in when we analyze the entire structure. So we're able to carry and then increase carrying capacity or equivalent capacity by reducing thickness. So in, our, in some slides, you will see I would have shown that we were able to reduce the thickness of the HMA within our structure. That would be cost savings in terms of that. Um, in terms of the cost of production, yeah, you'd have to consider cost for 
processing also. Um, remember, you have to put in the foam bitumen, the additives, the processing, transport proposal. But if you look at the overall cost of a uh, stabilized payment structure and cost of the conventional structure, because you are going to be reducing thicknesses in the stabilized payment structure, you're going to be able to have a lot of cost savings in terms of that. I think I would identify probably close to 20% in that particular application. So that's where the cost savings would come in. Maybe I can also jump in there. Yeah, so yes. One of the things that is important is the initial costs. And uh, this is what Lawrence just said. You know, I mean, the, 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 what is the biggest cost in any road project? It is the binder. Yeah, it is the, the cement. It is the, and the second biggest is the granular materials. So uh, either you, if you do it properly, you don't do it properly, the cost is there, you know, I mean, uh, and if you can save 1% bitumen, just 1% bitumen per kilometer uh, uh, or per ton or whatever, you know, you put it in it, in a, in a, it's a huge amount of money. That is, that is one point. If you can save 1% of the granular materials, yeah, because it, it depends, as I said, it can be 20%, but can also be 40 or 50%. Uh, it depends on the project. If you have wrap available, if you have, you know, one of the big problems we have, we have millions of kilometers that are built with, and they are being milled, and, and there are mountains of wrap. I mean, you go to the United States or even Mexico City or to other, there are huge mountains of wrap. I just came from the United States and I saw mountains of wrap, and that was in, that was in Massachusetts. And I can tell you, that is not a nice view. And this is material that's free. It's, they have actually to pay to get rid of this material. So there's another cost incentive. And last not least, you have to look at the life cycle cost. What happens after the, uh, the, the life cycle is finished, the, the design life is finished? You have to, you have, the, the, your pavement that is continuously bound is destroyed. So you have to take it out. You have to mill it out. You have to take it out. You don't need to take out the BSM layers. You, you can only mill them flat take out the, uh, the deformation, uh, the rut, and then you can use it another 20 years. Um, that, that really hits the costs a lot. You know? So there are these two aspects. Initial costs depends between, I would say, 15 to 30, 40% depends what, what you're looking at. If you use wrap, it's free of charge. Yeah? Even demolition waste nowadays is a problem. You know? So you have all these demolition waste. Put it through a, a crusher, use it as granular material and stabilize it with, uh, with BSM. So there, that is where, where you have a huge, I mean, you, you, we use between two to three and a half, three percent, no, I wouldn't say more than three percent, two and three percent of pitching versus five to six. So that is where the cost uh, 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 savings come from. Okay, excellent. So there are huge potential implications for cost savings in the short term, but also in the long term over the life cycle of the of the, the the payment and so those are very excellent answers as well and so that's just for consideration for those who are looking in that case now what about maintenance costs and the dust nuisance just based on what they have seen visually so someone had looked at the presentation before and they're asking about maintenance costs now is is there now as you said there's some saving over the life cycle but do, do we have any idea of that cost over let's say per kilometer or does it depend on the location well, normally what you do is, as I said, you have these structures and you, what they use uh, now normally is this UTFC, that's ultra thin friction courses, okay? That is in three centimeter, highly, uh, uh, let's say, uh, high quality uh, special asphalt uh, riding course layer. These layers last for, let's say, between six, eight, nine years, yeah? So every six to nine years, you have to mill that off. And you have to replace it. Yeah, I mean, bitumen uh, uh, layers are base layers. But they're, 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 they're Lawrence uh, showed that they can be trafficked immediately, which is also an important advantage. But they are base layers, yeah? so they have to be protected for water ingress and graveling and all these types of things. So you need to take care of these things. You need to take care of your your protective layer, which is the UTFC. Maybe three centimeters, maybe four centimeters and five centimeters. I think five centimeters is already, you know, uh, a little bit uh, uh, too much. Each centimeter is a lot of money. But maintenance is important as in any uh, 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 road construction. You need to have your drainage cleaned. You need to have uh, uh, watch your, your road. 
but basically it's the same that would apply to any any road construction you need to do your maintenance all right so in regards to sensitivity now towards moisture and climate predictions and extreme droughts or flooding is it highly sensitive to that more so than one would find in a hot mess asphalt or or or, or or any other type of structure that is like no this is that's a very good question and that's one of the things that surprised the south africans as well i showed the picture where i showed the upside down pavement as they call it in south africa yeah they do a cement treated base and on top of that they put a g1 high quality base granular material but to protect that material they put five centimeters of hot mix asphalt on top the problem with base layers base layers are by far the most effective uh, uh, road structures uh, in the world but bases fail when moisture gets in because the fines get out. You know, you have the pumping action and uh, you, you lose the fines, you lose your skeleton and the whole thing collapses. One of the advantages is when I uh, showed the picture of the distribution is that the foam bitumen and the bitumen captures the fines. It attacks the minus the uh, uh, mesh 200, under mesh 200, so minus uh, mesh 200. So, what we have here is an increased, what we call an increased durability. Uh, we've had, uh, I mean, Lawrence maybe can jump in there too. Uh, we've had these uh, layers uh, open to traffic under rain. And we thought now this is, this is the disaster. Now we, now we are really, we're really in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pick. But nothing happened because they actually, and this is something we also designed for, and uh, Lawrence can, can and, uh, you know, expand on that. Uh, an important uh, uh, criterion is the ret retained cohesion. Yeah, the retained cohesion is very important. Yeah, uh, and that is one of the things you do in the lab before you go onto the road and 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 play with materials that don't have retained cohesion. You don't want that. That doesn't work. Uh, but in just in summary, these uh, BSM layers have surprised us under soaked conditions. They have performed very well because they capture the, the fines. So if water ingresses, they actually behave or have a better uh, behavior uh, under, let's say, extreme soak conditions, which you would have in the Caribbean with huge rainfalls and things like that, um, uh, compared to, to, to standard granular materials. Excellent. Lawrence, I don't know if you wanted to say anything to that before we ask. Uh, yeah, I would actually yeah, agree with um, Jenna Kemp because in the mix design process, you would actually need to do a retained cohesion test on the shared properties and these materials need to maintain uh, uh, to ratio so above about 70%. So what he's saying is actually, I support those because the encapsulation of the fines within the material is actually gonna give it a bit of moisture durability. And we have seen those in our applications as well. It was, they were open, but they have a higher air void. So you need to seal them in the long term, but the early trafficking was allowed because of this uh, moisture durability that was available from the foam bitumen and the active filler treatment as well. Okay, so that's the on meeting, Mike. You wanted to say something here? Go ahead. Yes, um, Leighton. Uh, I can relate that we've had an incidence we were doing, um, in this case, in place called recycling. And we were hit with a downpour, a torrential downpour. We thought that what we had done would be a um, loss, yeah. but lo and behold, after the rain stopped and everything, we compacted the um, in place called recycled material. And within a day or two, it performed as if it was done even with the amount of rain. So the material generally has a lot more, is more forgiving in, um, humid conditions, obviously, than the unbound material, the um, pressure runs and the um, sub bases. So and we, we have seen this where we have specimens left in the open for almost a year and, and it hasn't um, deteriorated or crumbled. So as um, the presenters have put forward, the bitumen has coated all the fine colloidal materials, which is what causes the problem in a lot of the um, 
general material because that's what gives you the, well, it reduces friction and it reduces cohesion, especially when it's, um, it's got moisture with it. So I, I don't know, um, well, that's an experience and I think this piece of road is still doing all right after 10 years. That's some of the personal experience we've had here. All right, so we're a little bit over time, but we're going to have like one or two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, I want to leave time for Jose to come in and speak for a little bit as well. So the last question I asked you, Lawrence, is what percentage um, minimum compaction is required in the field? Yeah, so we, you usually aim for 100% um, max, maximum density because there have been research and it is, it is research that density would be related to strength and you'd want to get um, your layers compacted to refuse out so to ensure that you have a durable pavement structure and you prevent any pre -compa um, post compaction and so on as well. All right, thank you very much. Um, it can be your last question. In doing a BSM design, how important is, um, is it to achieve in the optimum gradation for the foaming? Well, it's very important. I mean, it's, uh, it's not, it's, there's an envelope and it's in all the documents. Uh, you have an envelope. What you want is you want a continuous graded material. Yeah. So if you have wrap, normally you won't have a, you, you would like to put it through a, through an impact crusher. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes you get these lumps, uh, crocodile cracking out of, of, so you would kind of bring it into the envelope. Yeah. But as uh, Cecil said, it is uh, uh, rather forgiving, but you know, it's not magic. It's just very basic engineering. Uh, and uh, if you take care of, uh, and if you don't cheat, <laughs> uh, then, then you get good results. But obviously it needs a continuously graded material. Yeah, so that's what it needs. Yeah, so you have to have your fines. So we're looking at minimum six to 7% of fines. And anything that goes above, let's say, let's say above 15%, I wouldn't even touch it, you know, but. Uh, if it goes into 10, 12% of fines, you should look at it, you know, I mean, but, but the, 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 the mixed design tests will show you because then you will have uh, uh, your pro problems with your cohesion and you will have uh, other types of problems. Yeah. But you have to do the whole, it's not only uh, the grading, it's the other back limits, it's, it's all your, it's, uh, uh, you have to go through the whole thing, you know, I mean, you have to understand the material you're talking, you, you're working with. And if you, and it's not difficult, it's all explained in, 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 a, in a document that's called TG2, Technical Guide 2, and just the new uh, version uh, has been published. That's a, that's a publicly available document, there's no copyrights on it, you can copy the hell out of it. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's millions and millions of dollars. And I appreciate uh, uh, these, this opportunity, uh, Dr. Ellis, uh, because, um, you know, I mean, we've done a pretty bad job with our planet so far, you know, and um, uh, here is the opportunity for the young, uh, young generations. Look at it, you know, don't take my word for it. Look at the technology, look at the book, and, you know, you, you, you make, make up your own mind. Excellent. Thank you very much for that final word. Now we're going to have a final word from Jose, uh, also a sales director at the uh, Regent. So go, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ellis. Um, and thank you for everyone for, for assisting to this conference. First of all, Dr. Maris and the University of West Indies who have always been supportive to, to us in all the technologies that we have in Vidkin Group. Uh, special thanks to Joachim Kemp for the excellent presentation that you did today. Uh, Lawrence, uh, you did an excellent presentation. All the experiences that you have in Trinidad and in the region are an enormous help for, for everyone to understand what we are doing. And, uh, and uh, I am here to help you. Resin Seal is a dealer for the whole Caribbean islands and Central America. We are here to support you and uh, in every sense, and we have an engineering department in which we can go with you, uh, you by your hand and, and help you out in the projects that you have in every sense. So uh, Dr. Ellis, I don't know if you can share the, the information that I send you to you so everybody can take a picture of, of my email and, uh, and my phone number. Uh, in case you need something, please just send me an email 
and I can forward all the, the manuals and all the information that Johan was talking about and, and, and we are here to support everyone. Thank you very much. Didn't get that one, but um, I will still share it with them at the end. So okay. it will be posted for them to review. So we just want to thank everyone for coming out and for participating, asking the relevant questions. As stated before, there are free um, downloadable content that one could find online, but we'll also make it available to you to make it easier. At the university here, we are interested in doing research in this area, looking at sustainable materials such as this one, as well as we're looking at other materials in the area, looking at rapid, the rap, as was mentioned, there's volumes of material available regionally and international that's just wasting, and that's access for us to use for research, but also for potential commercialization. And so as we work together to develop our region, we invite you, the students and former students, to engage with us and partner with us to do MPhil and PhD research, as well as we work together as, as the industrial side of it to commercialize these things even further. So thank you all again for the time. And even though we went over by a bit, we thank you for sticking out with us. And thank you for presenters as well for your time as you, you're all over the world. And we thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present to us. All right, so please enjoy the rest of your day. We are gonna, it's been recorded. It will be most likely shared on our YouTube channel. Um, so you'll be able to view it at a later stage and share it with your colleagues and others so you could you know go over and over to get it right as we develop this industry. Thank you all again. Please enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you.